a spoiled, rotten bulldog wants to do things his way until he meets pet trainer 911. What does this monkey, this elephant, Good. and this dog have in common? They can all be trained with this. Plus, an eager beagle makes a living with his nose. All coming up on Animal Attractions. If you're a pet lover, you've landed at the perfect place. Hi, I'm Krishanda Lee, and this is Animal Attractions TV, the show for people who have a special relationship with their pets, who may want to learn more about how to care for them, how to train them, and most of all, just how to get the most fun out of your time together. And today's show is no exception. But our first story is what can happen to you when you love your pet maybe a little too much. Let's take a look. Deuce. 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 The cutest puppy the Petersons had ever seen. I love Deuce. I just adore him. Every time he looks at me, my face just melts. Unfortunately, he used those irresistible great looks to get his way his entire puppy life. Now that he's reached manhood, he's a spoiled little monster. He jumps on everyone, knocks over the kids, and the family is sick of these bad behaviors. Come on, Deuce. Deuce gets birthday parties. Birthday cake time, come on. Oh, Happy birthday. Deuce gets um, shirts made with his name on them, collars with his name. Deuce is a very, very spoiled dog. My husband is a professional football player, and Mike is on the road a lot, so uh, most of the time I'm here by myself, so Deuce is basically my companion and uh, the protector of our house. The problem is, is that Deuce tends to not listen to me. He gets very stubborn, and he thinks that he is the boss in this relationship. Deuce is very much um, the alpha dog around other dogs so he thinks that he can bully me around as well so there's a constant tug of war between us we'll be walking and he will just take off in one direction and I'm walking in the other and neighbors have had to bring him home And when we're having dinner, he'll come to the table and he'll beg, he'll put his head on your, on your knee, or he'll cry, or he'll bark. Or even if you get away, um, if you get up to go get something to drink, he'll come and put his head on the table to try to take the food away from you. Deuce is very, very strong. I cannot pull him. Once he plants himself and he decides that he's going to stay put, he's staying put. Deuce, come use the bathroom. When he doesn't get his way, he'll push you. He very much likes to be the center of attention with everyone that comes into the house. If someone else is having a conversation with me or I'm playing with a baby or another puppy, he gets very jealous and he has to have all of my attention. Hey, I gotta get you trained. I gotta get you trained. You are too bad. I knew that Deuce would be very stubborn and I knew that I would have to find someone that was very qualified and that had patience in dealing with a caliber of dog like Deuce. A lady named Miss Pete called me and said she had an English Bulldog. And she asked me have I ever worked with an English Bulldog. And uh, I told her yes and you know, I trained any kind of dog. She told me what he was doing and uh, that he uh, would, wouldn't listen to her. Hi. How you doing, Ronald White? John Paul Peter. Nice, nice to meet you. Of course, she told me she didn't have any kids, and this was her kid, this deuce. And have you seen that face on him? He, he almost got to me when I got there. This is Deuce. Oh, okay. But he gave you that, that sad look, and his teeth were hanging out of his mouth. And uh, he was kind of funny, but he was also lovable. He's getting out of hand, and we just really don't know what to do with him anymore. We really need your help. We're going to take your dog for 30 days, and then when I come back to train you, I got seven days. I get days. to call him, right? I you get, get to twice. You get to call me twice. Okay. And when I come he is my son. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come on. 
Bye, Deuce. Okay, come on. It was miserable while he was gone, even though he had all of these bad behaviors. He is a part of our family, and he is basically my baby for right now. When they got the dog, they said that when he was little, he walked off into the pool, and the husband heard a thump in the water, and it was him, and he jumped in there and got him, and he gave the little dude mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. -mouth the dog brought him back, and uh, now he follows him everywhere. But Deuce is a, is a spoiled brat, so that's why he don't feel like he has to listen. What are you doing, buddy? Huh? What are you doing, huh? So when I get back to the house, you know, I got to like that little uh, English bulldog. So we got to know each other, and four or five days went by, and I knew I couldn't work him like a regular dog because he was not only short and stubby, and, you know, he had weight on him. They don't work long. They couldn't be out there an hour. So I worked him 15 minutes at a time, let him rest for about an hour, then got him back up and worked him again. So I had to take my time with Deuce. So when I, would, when I started with Deuce training him, uh, I was taking him through his set downstairs, and he had a problem with leaning on you. He would lean on you. So I would take my left knee and I would just push him over, but I would let him hear me tell him off. Off. Well, with that look, with big old eyes and them teeth hanging out of his mouth, and he was looking, he was a cute dog. He was just something about his face. So I would uh, work him, he would look at me, and I would start laughing. So uh, I had to work on my look with Deuce. Come here. And in the house, Deuce had to learn how to go to his own bed. Because she would actually pick him up to put him in her bed. Time out. Time out. So we taught Deuce how to go to his own bed. We tell him time out, he would go to his bed. Now when I first started with Deuce, he didn't want to go. So I had to push him in there and show him. And I called him out to let him know that's his place for now on. She already told me he begs and whines. And he started begging for me, jumping in my lap trying to get my teddy chips and wouldn't listen. So I slightly just pulled down and told him off. And he would get down, then he tried to get back up on me again, and I corrected him, told him off. But I didn't give him anything, and I didn't talk to him. And eventually, he knew not to come up in my lap when I was eating. But you can't feed him from your plate. So that's what starts begging, and that's what Miss Pete was doing. So when I got done with this, and he was uh, sitting down and staying, I would tell him to go to timeout. He was shaking when I told him to shake, and uh, I knew that he was ready to go home. So I called Miss Peter and asked if she was ready to be trained. I really, really missed Deuce. Just having him around, and most of the time, all he does is sleep. But just knowing that he's in the house is really important to us. Deuce! Deuce! Hi, Deuce! Hi, Deuce! Hi, Deuce! And she had to get past looking at that cute face of Deuce and that look he gives you. I'm train you. Okay. She had to get past that and show him that she is the dominant dog and the dog is going to listen to her. Tell him heel. Okay, heel. I'll turn back around say place. Place. Go ahead and start walking. Just keep walking. Say place. Place. Keep walking. Hand down to your side. Turn back toward me. Back toward me. Now once you say stop. Stop. There you go. Tell him down. Give him a little pull. Down. There you go. Now tell him stay. Stay. Stretch that lead out. Come towards me. There you go. In a matter of 30 days, Deuce was a changed dog. She was tickled to death to see him going to his timeout, sitting down and staying. She couldn't wait to tell her husband. Timeout. Timeout. He almost got to me, but I couldn't let him see the other side. I had to stay strong with Deuce. And Mrs. Peterson's going to have to stay strong with Deuce and don't let him win with that look that he gives you. <laughs> oh, he did real good. Hey, and this is the last fun. day, and uh, you gave me a list, and now I'm going to give you one of his commands. Okay. And that will keep the dog trained in you. 
Oh, Mr. White, I tell you, you are a miracle worker because Deuce is a changed dog. Miss Peterson is very happy. Deuce is now a happier dog. I am just overjoyed that Deuce will now listen and do what he needs to do. Um, I have no worries about bringing kids into the house or about Deuce knowing um, his place or what he needs to do. Even though he was cute and all oh, little and short, uh, he was getting away with a lot of stuff. I know that from going to Mr. White that I have a trained dog that listens and um, is friends with everybody. This is Zawadi. In Swahili, Zawadi means the gift. She's gentle, friendly, and trainable, as are most animals. Whether there are small domestic pets or big girls like her. <laughs> she loves these leaves. Okay? Today we're going to learn about clicker training, which can be beneficial to our pets as well as to exotic animals from the wild. Good, come in line. Steady. Good girl, that's good line, Moki. When we start a clicker training program with an animal, which uh, we also, we here call operant conditioning, the first thing we do is we form uh, an association with the animal between the clicker and something positive, whether it's food or attention. Good girl, that's a good girl. And therefore they associate that sound as some, being something positive and something they want to work for. Good girl, that's a good girl. We use clicker training here at the zoo uh, to facilitate husbandry and medical uh, procedures with the animals. It reduces the amount of stress that the staff and the animals have to go through to uh, get things like um, examinations, vaccines, um, x-rays, all of those things we can do without immobilizing animals through the use of clicker training. What? Good, steady foot. So with the elephant steady. training, the elephant Good. keepers uh, use operant conditioning or clicker training to uh, teach the elephants to do a lot of things to help facilitate their medical care as well. One of the important things with elephants is to be able to take care of their feet. Elephants in the wild walk a lot and they wear their feet down, keep them in good condition by doing a lot of walking. So in the zoos without as much uh, room to roam, we have to make sure to take care of their feet by trimming them down ourselves. Smoky trunk. We use clicker training a lot with uh, primates, especially at the zoo, especially the apes. Um, because they need to have regular routine uh, health examinations. I enjoy working with primates because they have um, a lot of personality. Each individual is unique. Um, they're extremely intelligent and uh, for that reason they're easy to train using different techniques um, because of their intelligence level. They also are uh, very similar to us in their um, in their uh, habits and in their physiology, so I find them interesting because they're so similar to humans. Good. Head. Good. Open. Chest. Lily knows a lot of body exam behaviors, which means she'll present various parts of her body to us so we can get a good look at it. Um, also, if she has wounds on any part of her body, we're able to topically treat that um, because she'll present the body part to us. Good. Turn around. There. Good. Good girl. Lily right now has a hand injury. Um, a broken finger actually, and we're trying to get an x-ray of that hand. Uh, so the keepers are working to train her to stick her hand under the door onto an x-ray plate where we'll be able to use a portable x-ray machine to get a picture of her hand so we know how to treat her. Okay, good girl. Just like people uh, form a close bond with their pets at home, the uh, staff at the zoo also forms very close relationships with the animals that they work with. The big difference is that they're wild animals and you have to be much more careful about your personal safety when you're around them than you do with your pets at home. But we do form close relationships with them and that's what allows us to do things like training with the animals at the zoo. That a girl. You're a good girl. 
Pretty much any animal that can hear the sound of your clicker can be clicker trained. Obviously some are more challenging than others based on intelligence level. You first need to find out what motivates the animal. Is it food? Is it attention? Is it praise? Good girls. And once you know that, you start associating that favorite thing of theirs with the sound of the clicker. Sit. Down. That's a good dog. That's a good dog. I've enjoyed pets all my life. In fact, today I have two cats, two dogs, an Arabian horse, and a miniature horse. It'd be terrible if I had allergies and couldn't be close to these beautiful creatures. But now there's good news for people with pet allergies, and it comes in a very huggable package. Take a look. First thing you think of when you hear the word mutant. An ugly monster from a science fiction movie? Or a cute, cuddly creature with velvety fur and a great personality? That last kind of mutant is today's perfect pet. Cornish Rex cat is a cat that uh, originally came from a domestic cat, an ordinary barn cat. It's a mutation, uh, which means that it is distinct to itself, and if you don't breed a Cornish Rex to a Cornish Rex, you get a straight-coated cat. The distinctive features about the Cornish Rex is the fact that it has only one layer of coat. It also has a very distinct, long, whippy tail. Those characteristics make the Cornish Rex very unique. Although it's the wavy coat that gets the most double takes, Cornish Rex ears are also hard to overlook. They're large and deep as cat ears go. Set upon the sleek and slender Cornish Rex face, they're always striking and sometimes comical. There's three very specific health considerations you're going to want to remember when owning a Cornish Rex. The first are their ears. The elongation of the ear canal can make them prone to certain kinds of ear problems, so you're going to want to get started on an ear cleaning protocol as young as you can in the cat's life. Another area of consideration is the skin. Because this is the result of a genetic mutation, it makes them prone to certain kinds of problems, and you're going to want to have the skin checked out early on in the cat's life so you can avoid certain dermatological problems like stud tail and other forms of problems that are related to nutrition. Sometimes, if they don't have the proper diet, their hair coat may not develop properly. The last area of concern is their body temperature. These cats, because they are a genetic mutation, have a body temperature of about 102 normally, which is higher than normal. They're also exquisitely sensitive to changes in ambient temperature in the room. So you're going to want to make sure that you have a good climate control in your house when you have these cats around. Another unique quality of the Cornish Rex cat is the fact that it doesn't shed. Some people who usually have allergic reactions around cats find that they can tolerate the Cornish Rex. They may be the perfect cat if you have allergies. They only have one layer of coat and they don't shed at all as compared to the normal domestic short haired cat. And this makes it perfect in helping avoiding allergy problems that people often have in related to owning pets like cats and dogs. If you've never seen a Cornish Rex before, you might be surprised to learn that it's one of the most popular cat breeds in America. To find a cute curly kitten of your very own, check a cat magazine for a good breeder near you. There's more than one member of the pet world that's compatible with people who have allergies. To find out more about them, log on to our website, animalattractionstv.com. You know, cats and dogs exhibit some of the same symptoms of allergies that we do. But if you see your pet sniffling or coughing, it may be a sign of something much more serious. Take a look. These days, our dogs aren't just stay-at-home dogs. They go to the dog park, the groomer, and even doggy daycare. Although this may be good for socialization, there are things that they can pick up from other dogs when they're there. 
You may have heard of kennel cough, which is an upper respiratory infection of dogs that causes coughing, but there's a newly emerging disease called canine influenza, which we're just beginning to recognize. With kennel cough, your dog is usually eating and drinking and still feeling pretty good. They have a bad cough, but your veterinarian can help that with some medication. However, with canine influenza, they still have a cough, but they can be feeling really sick. The symptoms that differentiate this from kennel cough are lack of appetite, lethargy, and fever. Canine influenza can be very serious and sometimes even fatal, so make sure your veterinarian knows if you see any of these signs. I'm not trying to scare you because the number of cases are really pretty low, but since this is a new disease, I'd like you to be aware of it. So if your dog has a cough and any of these other signs that I've talked about, please contact your veterinarian. You often hear stories of surgeons and concert pianists who must protect their hands. They must keep them in optimal working condition. But imagine your dog is so special you must protect its nose. It's not a job for the ordinary handler. Your assignment, if you choose to accept it, preserve the nose of a super dog. A man and his dog, but not just any man and not just any dog. This is a highly specialized unit, a high performance work team devoted to a unique and important job. Everyone wants to know about Brandon, everyone who comes in, everyone who calls, they want to know if he's real, if he really does termite inspections, and he does. It's amazing that he can just locate exactly, exactly where the termites are in your house. Hey, Rick. Hey, good morning. Hey, Brandon. I have a canine today. Yes, sir. Here's your paperwork. All right, thanks. Have a good day. You too. What sets Brandon and the canine inspection apart from a human inspection is visual inspections, you can only see 33% of the house. You cannot see what's inside walls, underneath, you know, the ground. You just can't see that. With using the canine, it's basically an x-ray. Brandon's nose is 400 to 600 times greater than a human's nose. He's able to find termites under bathtubs and places that a human couldn't inspect. And it's very important that I train with Brandon every day. Um, what it's designed to do is there can be a number of different scents inside a wall. So you want to try to... You train the dog to pinpoint live termite scent and to be able to pick it out of other scents like termite damaged wood, dead termites, you know, plastic, whatever anybody could, you know, that could be left in that wall. I have uh, four training stations. The first one basically has a little plastic container in it, but we want to make sure the dog is not alert on plastic. So we put that in there empty. Uh, the second canister actually has termite damaged wood that we basically got from a house that we did a treatment on. The third canister is just blank. The fourth canister actually have the live termites in it. When he goes into work mode, it's almost like football. He gets his game face on. And his nose goes and it starts tracking and tracking until um, he finds a uh, termite or a termite colony. Hunter cheese, Brandon. Hunter cheese, let's go. Let's go work. Let's go work. Let's go work, Brandon. Find your cheese, let's go. Good boy, good boy, Brandon. The dog is trained to associate that live termite scent with the food reward that I give him. That's a good boy, Brandon. Good boy, good boy. For the last three years when we've been recertifying through the University of Florida and through um, the Canine Academy, um, Brandon and Rick as a team has um, scored 100% in each test, even outperforming all the other dogs in the country and even his original um, trainer. Brandon really enjoys what he does. When we get ready to do the inspection, uh, he'll get real excited and... Hey, how you doing? Hey, Rick and Brandon. I'm here to do canine inspection today. Human nose has 5 million scent cells. Uh, Beagle's nose has about 250 million scent cells. And what it does is it enables him to be able to scent detect through stucco, through brick walls, through concrete slabs with stress cracks. It's like early detection for cancer. You're able to find a problem before it spreads through the rest of the house, saving the homeowner thousands of dollars in damage. On your teeth, let's go. Show me. Good boy, Brandy. Good boy. There's there, there's word commands, and they're actually part of the inspection. Um, some of the things I say, Brandon, are you ready to go to work? 
and I'll tell him to find his T's, T's being short for termites. Uh, when he does find termites, I'll say, good boy, Brandon. And he'll come to me, and then I'll reward him and say, show me, show me, Brandon. And then he goes back and shows, you know, it's just part of it. It's good work. I'll do the inside first, then I'll take the dog out on the outside of the structure, run in the same area. On your teeth, Brandon. If the dog alerts in the same area where he did on the inside, then we'll dot it with an orange dot. But it, what it does is it confirms that termites are actually in that wall. If he can pull the scent from both sides, then you know that's where they are. We finished the canine inspection, and we did have one alert at the fireplace. You couldn't do the inspection without me, and I couldn't do it without him. I um, mean, you know, it is a team. Everything we do from the time we get up to being in the truck all day to doing the inspections to, you know, doing meet and greet, it wouldn't be, there's no way you could do it with one without the other. Brandon is part of their family, not only with the family as well as Rick's pets. He has a little dox hound and his small kids and they all interact real well and, you know, but everybody knows that they have a celebrity living with them at their house. Good boy, Brandon. Good boy. Way to go, Brandon. You do an amazing job. I think most pets are happiest when they have a job to do, even if it's just keeping us company. Great toots. For more stories on pets and their jobs, or more ideas and information on anything you've seen here today, visit our website at animalattractionstv.com. It's your resource for a great relationship with your pets. I'm Megan Blake, and this is Toot Sweet the Travel Kitty for all of us here at Animal Attractions TV. Thanks for joining us. Toot. I've got a great book for you. Let's see. Here we go.